The start of the Around the World race was only 40 days away, and we had to decide if we wanted to continue. The boat was righted, and after a critical analysis, we thought we could get her ready in time. Apart from a new keel, we needed a new mast, new sails, and new electronics. Although three of the original crew dropped out, everyone's morale was high as we worked flat out to get her ready. 35 days later, with her new lead keel firmly bolted on, drum was put back into the water, and the 100-foot spare mast was fixed into place. It was a great day. I can't own enough gratitude for the people here, the, for everybody, the Moody's people especially. They've been, you know, we slotted right back into the same shed, uh, had the same guys on the job, and they've had 100% support for us. And we, I knew that we could do it. I was 100% confident that they would do it. Five days later, on September the 28th, 1985, Drum prepared to sail 27,000 miles around the world. She'd been in the water only long enough to clock up 70 miles, and instead of a sea trial, she was going to sail the 7,000 mile length of the Atlantic. There were 15 yachts competing in the Whitbread, of which seven were maxis. Because of the different designs, no one really knew how the boats would square up against each other. Certainly no one knew what sort of challenge drum would be. Just coming up, any second now. Maxis are the giants of ocean racing, with their 80-foot hull and their 10-story masts carrying sails the size of two tennis courts. They are an image of unstoppable power. As we all headed down the Solent, Drum charged into the lead. We knew that the strain on the gear was going to be a constant worry, but we didn't expect a spinnaker to split only 20 minutes into the race. Drum slowed to a halt, and while the other boats tried to catch up, we changed the spinnaker in 90 seconds. It's a long five-week haul down to Cape Town on Leg 1, best described as a 7,000-mile obstacle course of weather systems. There are big gains or big losses to make, as we painfully found out as early as off the northwest corner of Spain. On the strength of a weather forecast, a few of the Maxis split tactics and diverged from the course in hopes of being the first to pick up a predicted southwesterly, moving in from a deep low in mid-Atlantic. On drum, we opted for the direct track near the Iberian Peninsula, banking on finding a strong local following wind known as the Portuguese trades. It was a bad move, as the northerlies never materialized for us. Boats like Line and UBS, who went west, caught the new wind, and by the time we were off the coast of Morocco three days later, had jumped over 100 miles ahead of us. 
We felt better by the time we reached the halfway mark in the fickle winds of the doldrums, as the leaders had stopped first and we'd caught up. Getting south into the trade winds, the weather worsened steadily. There were reports of Force 9 gales rounding the Cape, and later, when we hit them, the maxi started to break up. The pounding sea conditions had split the laminations of the fiberglass hull in the port bow sections, and it was obvious to everyone that if the hull breached, she would go down in a jiffy. Every one of us must have lent a thought to the life raft situation. Two weeks before, one of our two ten-man rafts had accidentally inflated due to a faulty gas cylinder. I didn't relish the idea of fitting 17 men in a 10-man raft, or the skipper's duty of deciding who would if they all couldn't. At a slow speed, we limped in the direction of the shore in hopes of reaching the small fishing port of Luderitz in Namibia. Code Dor, who reported similar problems with delamination, also had to slow down, but continued south. And Privateer, when only 220 miles from the finish and leading the fleet, lost her mast and turned for Luderitz. Luckily, 48 hours later, the wind and seas had eased off. We immediately undertook makeshift repairs and shored up the flexing sections with floorboards and aluminum tubing. We scrubbed the Luderitz plan and headed once again for Cape Town in the finish. Privateer had managed to make Luderitz and erect a sewer pipe as a jury rig mast, but this broke after only 12 hours during her last bid to make the finish under sail. They motored into Cape Town, which disqualified them from the leg. Code Door had made it as well as NZI, also suffering mass damage. And we lived in at last, two days behind the leg winner UBS Switzerland. In Cape Town, we had three weeks to haul her out of the water and make our repairs. While other crews took a break, we worked day and night to get drum ready for the next leg. With the crew's morale at rock bottom, they needed a bit of a pep talk. If it's a dead calm for the last week before we start, we start the second leg, we race the boat hard, we get 10 days out, the thing starts to move around, come and drift again or whatever. And we have to accept the fact that we may have to retire and pull into Perth, pull into Hobart, Christ knows where. So I think it's up to the, up to the individual to, to look for his own guidance or salvation. <laughs> So there's just the four of us doing the next thing. <laughs> that's how I viewed it, and that's how I um, kind of explained things to the crew and um, how we all looked at it in the end. But never, never getting away from that. When you set out, and the wind starts to blow, and the boat heels over, and you, you immediately think, is this thing going to be okay? I thought the worst that could happen was is that the repair we did wouldn't be 100% correct and we'd show signs of movement again or something not quite right and we'd have to drop out maybe in Perth or Hobart. I didn't think the boat was going to sink. I would have never started out if I thought that.